Welcome, everyone. If you could take your seats, that would be great. I'm Carol Berman, class, CALS class of 1994. I'm a vice president of the CALS Alumni Association. And before I introduce our next speaker, I wanted to provide some important updates. So first, if you've been to Cornell or haven't been to Cornell, or the next time you get up to Cornell, I invite you to check out the new Ag Quad. The, it's, it's beautiful, it's re-landscaped, the sidewalks are wider, the lighting is brighter, there's a lot more seating and places to gather, and it's a really beautiful space, so I invite you to check it out the next time you're there. And secondly, CALS re recently launched a new brand initiative that you'll be hearing about in the next few months. In short, our purpose at CALS is to tackle the challenges of our times through purpose-driven science that advances understanding and improves life. We haven't changed the school's mission, but we've given some thought to how we describe it. As one of the premier institutions of scientific learning, we connect the life, agricultural, environmental, and social sciences to provide world-class education, spark unexpected discoveries, and inspire pioneering solutions. But that's a lot to say all the time, so we have a new tagline. And new hats. And the tagline is life changing. I think it really fits us well. And it's a perfect segue into talking about why we're all here right now. Many of us will never visit the top of Mount Everest or Antarctica, although I see somebody in the audience who has. <laughs> but thanks to virtual reality technology, many more of us can see and get some semblance of an experience. Maybe that's a theme park ride that's driven by VR. And if you've been to Universal Orlando Resort or Disney World, you know that VR can definitely provide the thrills of a real roller coaster. How many of us have put on the goggles and walked into a wall or become really disoriented? And there's a reason for that. VR can have many more applications, thanks to the work of people like our next speaker. Andrea Stevenson Wan directs the Virtual Embodiment Lab in the Department of Communications at CALS. Her lab focuses on how VR changes people's perceptions. There's also work being done in avatars. What do we think we look like in a virtual world? And it's not all about gaming. Her work involves therapeutic pursuits, like measuring stress on students. She's also working with an interdisciplinary team at Stanford to study VR and pain reduction, work that first made national news in 2016. Well, we don't have to wear VR goggles or an Oculus Rift today, because we're joined by Professor Wan in the flesh. So welcome, Professor Wan. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I'm honored to be here today to talk to you all. And I just want to tell you, looking at the audience, that just because I didn't remember to wear red, it doesn't mean that I don't also love Cornell and Cal's. But <laughs> it's nice to just visually get evidence of support uh, for our university. Uh, so today, I'm uh, going to talk about uh, communication in virtual world. So this is dr material drawn from a class I teach uh, in communication um, that talks about virtual reality, but particularly social interactions in virtual reality. And what I'd like to discuss is how people feel embodied in virtual environments and why we care about that. And this is particularly, what I'll focus on today is particularly in a social context, when you interact with other people in virtual spaces, um, how do we do that? Um, and uh, why is it important that that's an embodied experience? So virtual reality captures user movement and replaces sensory input from the real world with digital content. And even the simplest forms of virtual reality do that. Um, Let's do, if you don't mind, a little experiment on social interaction in the real world. So if you could just take a moment and turn to the person that's next to you, and if you don't know them yet, introduce yourself and say a few words about yourself. And if you do, even if you know each other, just say how you're feeling today. Okay.
So this is great. You're a super friendly crowd. <laughs> so we've already made some networking connections. Um, so what did you do when you introduced yourself? Well, back from the speakers. When you introduced yourself, um, you said some words, and you listened to the words that the other person said. But what else did you notice about them? What other cues did you look for? Can I see? Facial expressions, yeah. Did anybody shake hands? Yeah, so you got some, some, some touch, some gesture. Uh, you probably also listened to tone of voice. Probably most of you made eye contact with each other, right? So when we're communicating with other people, uh, we know that our words are important. But we also all know that our nonverbal behavior is very important. And this is something that's been the subject of research by social scientists, but also just as humans interacting in the world, which is something that we're naturally attentive to and we're also interested in learning more about. So when we think about having interactions in virtual reality, we also have to think how we can take all of this information that we get to face in in face-to-face -face interactions and transform that into the virtual world. But this is a challenge because everything we see in virtual reality, everything we hear in virtual reality is mediated. Our experiences are mediated. By definition, um, we can only see what the system presents to us. So what we're going to talk about today is what kind of information we can pull in and how that information is presented in social contexts. Um, one question that I love to ask when I'm talking about virtual reality is how many people have tried it at all? And this is an answer that gets more interesting every year. So even if, it, even if it's the cardboard on the New York Times, can you raise your hand high and say that you've, you've tried even the phone-based where you put your phone in the little cardboard device and look around 360-degree uh, video? That's virtual reality. So it used to be that when I would ask that question in front of an audience, nobody that hadn't been in my lab and put on my headset um, had had that experience. And that experience has gotten more and more common. So in the past, uh, when we studied virtual reality, um, it's been studied for decades before it got anywhere near the consumer market. And we would look at how we could use it as a tool to study uh, social interactions, human psychology. It's been used for a long time as a tool to train people to take action uh, in the real world. And it's also been used for some clinical applications like uh, pain reduction. But there have always been people interested in studying virtual reality as a medium in itself. So when we'd write papers about how people interacted in virtual reality and how that was different from how people interacted in the real world or how it was the same, uh, we would always have this paragraph that said, and someday, People will be interacting socially in virtual reality in their home, and we need to understand how that will affect them. So let me ask another question. So we're closer to that, but we're not quite there yet. How many people here at work or at home have one of the consumer virtual reality headsets like an Oculus Rift, HTC Vive? So we see more hands. So there's people, hmm? PlayStation B. So card yeah, well, yeah, cardboard if you use it, yeah. So we see more people that have these, these headsets. How many of you have used these to interact socially with someone at home or at work? You've been in there with another person, even playing a game? Yes. So we have this capacity now, but it's less common. So we're, it's this really interesting point where we see people developing virtual environments where you can go and interact socially, but they're still not in common use yet. So we're at this point where it's, it's even more urgent to understand um, what happens in those kinds of situations. And now is the time for us as consumers to think about what we want to see and what kind of virtual worlds we want to live in. So let's look at some of these social virtual worlds that some people are already interacting with. Um, if you are familiar with any of these, if you've seen them in the news, I'd be curious if you raise your hands. So high fidelity is one world in which people can go in and design their own avatar, so they can be a butterfly avatar person, um, and meet other people all over the world, and they can walk up to them and shake their virtual hands. They can talk to them, 
and hear their voice at the same time that they see their gestures in, in, uh, through the headset uh, in this virtual world. Sansar is another uh, virtual world kind of similar to High Fidelity that allows people to create content um, so that they can build a castle um, in virtual reality and have other people come and walk around in it in avatar form. Facebook Spaces, has anybody heard of this? So this is an environment, and you can see it looks very Facebook, um, in which people can get together through by logging into their Facebook profile um, and engage with people that they're friends with on Facebook already as avatars. They can look at content together, they can see each other's gestures, they can shake hands, um, they can even uh, play games together, make little drawings in virtual space. And Altspace VR is, a, is another world like this um, in which people can move around, um, meet friends, talk to friends, but jointly look at objects in the virtual world and generally interact a lot like they do in real life with a number of limitations. Um, so something that's interesting about these worlds, if we click through, does anybody notice anything particular about the way these worlds are similar or different? In the middle. They're, so people are being animated, they're gesturing, right? They're taking advantages of the ability to get their gestures in there. It's also all people, right? It's always interesting to me the extent to which we replicate the real world over again in a virtual space. But you'll also notice that there's some variety in appearance here. So these avatars are pretty cartoony, um, and these avatars are a little more realistic. So these come from historical virtual worlds like Second Life. Does anybody remember Second Life as an environment? Yeah, so this was a space in which people could go um, and interact via avatars and move them around the board uh, via keystroke and have interactions um, and conversations and visit um, different imaginary places in the virtual environment. And although this never really took off as an environment, um, not all of you have been in Second Life. For different groups of people, it was extremely meaningful. So there were communities, um, in, particularly in um, communities where people didn't have the ability to get together physically, where they would have very meaning, meaningful social interactions in these uh, virtual spaces. Uh, and it's still around today. Um, and some of these virtual worlds that we see, like High Fidelity and Sansar, are related to those, these older virtual worlds. So they're, they're being built off of these older virtual environments and they bring some of that history with them. So I'm going to quickly talk about if you're moving around in a virtual environment, um, if you're able to reach out and shake someone's hand in a virtual space, how can you do that? How can you communicate that gesture? So in a virtual environment, we know that at the minimum, you have to have the ability to look around it. So a user's heads are tra uh, head movements are tracked. And then the surroundings that you're seeing on your headset, whether that's a phone-based headset or whether that's um, a standalone virtual reality system, it's going to give you those images on two little screens in front of your eyes. That seems so simple, but for those of you who have tried it, it gives you this illusion of being transported into this virtual space. Even though you know that it's just two screens in front of your eyes, you tend to react to content you see on those screens as if it were real. Um, and you, um, the reason why that is so effective is because it's reacting to your movement. So just as I move my head around in real life and see changes in the virtual, in, in the in what I see in front of my eyes updated, I get the same effect if I'm looking through a headset. So that link between movement and what appears on the screens is crucial. So a collaborative virtual environment allows multiple users to be together. And it does that by tracking the user's movements in space. So all virtual worlds We'll have orientation tracking. Uh, 
This is just the movements of your head as you look around a space. Um, and if there's any engineers in the audience, um, this is also, we tend to use interchangeably orientation or rotational tracking. So forgive me for, for uh, that conflation. Uh, but this means that even if you can't move around the environment, when you do this pitch yawn roll, when you move your head around the space, the content updates in front of your eyes. And in other environments, we also have positional tracking. So this gives us the ability uh, to step around in the world to move towards someone and reach out to them and make contact, um, or to uh, pick up objects and bring the objects close to us to engage with objects in the, in the real world, in the virtual world. So one thing that my lab tends to do is it tends to stick closely to consumer-based systems since those have been available. So if we look at um, this range of images, this shows marker-based systems that were available uh, in the past, like a motion capture suit. How many people are familiar with this? Uh, right, from filmmaking, so um, Lord of the Rings style uh, motion capture where you capture many points on the body. Um, and this is still a really interesting area of research, is, is how to capture vertical movement. But what we're currently using in the lab, and we'll probably continue to use, are the consumer systems such as um, the HTC Vive, the Oculus uh, Touch, Rift Touch system, which you can see up in the upper left. And what's important about these is that it's a, a system that visually tracks your hands and your heads, but that's all it tracks. So all the information that um, is coming into the system about what you're doing is from these three points, head and hands. So we can get position and orientation from these, but what are all the things that aren't tracked? So everything else that you're moving. So nobody knows where my elbows are in the system, right? What else, when, we were t when you guys were interacting, when you were conversing with each other, what, is, what information were you not getting from that system? No facial expressions. Gaze is also not totally present. So we can infer gaze from head position, right? So I, we can guess if my head's moving here, I'm probably looking in this corner of the room, but I could actually be gazing over to my left. We don't know that unless we're actually tracking eye position. So there is this um, sort of minimal way to infer gaze. So there's a lot of information that isn't in here. And the information that isn't in here, we know is important in social interactions. There are also non-marker-based systems like the Connect um, or the Leap uh, that can track movement without having to uh, wear trackers. Uh, but these are also not going to really get facial expressions in a virtual environment. So why is that? Think of all the pictures you've seen of people acting in, in, in VR. You have something covering your face, right? So you have a really minimal ability to capture those, those facial expressions. So when we think about what it's like to be a person, to be an embodied person in a virtual space, we're uh, coming off of really minimal uh, cues that are going into the system. So we know that in other ways of, of interacting in a, in a mediated way, people are pretty good at adjusting to that. So we text a lot. We have no information about facial expression, about tone of voice, um, but we, we interpret other cues that we get from the system to get contextual information for the words that we're hearing. Anybody, so some examples, of how do you know if somebody's mad at you on text? So you could have a, you could have a, um, Punctuation changes, you can have emojis or emoticons, you could have a pause, a long, terrible pause. Um, so there are a lot of ways to convey, to sort of convey the context for your words. And this, an interesting question in, a, in virtual reality is we tend to react to the things in virtual reality as if they were face to face because we're sort of tricked into um, thinking that it is the real world because it has depth um, and it's immersive. But it's actually a very similar problem to communicating over any other medium where it's not 
Um, you're not getting the full bandwidth of face-to-face -face communication. So it's this fascinating open question. It's like, what do we assume from the cues that we get? And how will we adapt to those cues as we become more familiar with them? And what can we do uh, with those cues to improve our experiences? And this kind of uh, goes along the, line, along the lines of uh, what is already being done to improve our experiences that we may not necessarily immediately notice. So, when we look at um, how people are represented in a virtual environment, we know already, it's like, what information am I pulling in as a person? All the system is getting is my voice, maybe, and then um, my head and hand movements. And everything else is going to uh, be determined by the system. So, um, in, I want to narrow down the talk a little further by saying that when we think about social interactions and virtual reality, there's a whole really interesting area of research looking at agent-based interactions. And those are interactions where you're essentially talking to the computer. So you're talking to something that looks like a person and may behave like a person, but it's not being controlled by a real person in real time. And this has a, a bunch of really interesting um, applications uh, for education, um, for healthcare, if you can have a sort of an artificial intelligence that you can interact with as if it were an embodied person. But for our purposes, we're just going to talk about avatars. And an avatar is controlled by a living entity. I have uh, a person in parentheses uh, because that's the important use case we're going to be talking about. But if you want to amuse yourself, you can go on YouTube and look at people uh, putting trackers on their dogs and cats. And that is actually also an avatar because it's a virtual um, entity that's being controlled by a living animal. So, how do we behave in virtual environments? So, the short-term answer is, is that we tend to behave a lot as uh, very similarly to how we do in the real world. There's some interesting caveats to that. Uh, but work in looking at social interactions in particular in virtual environments has shown that people re react to content, um, scary content, we tend to recoil from, um, exciting content, we tend to be emotionally aroused by. Um, and even in social interactions, uh, we tend to behave with other people or, or agents that we believe to be people in ways similarly to how we do in the real world. So, for example, uh, we respect personal space. So, if you're in a virtual environment and I see another avatar, I have a body of some kind, they have a body of some kind, there's no physical reason why I can't just walk right through them. But it feels incredibly rude. It, it's, it's really challenging. It, this used to be an exercise that I would get my students to do uh, where you go in, you, you have an avatar, the other person has an avatar. It doesn't look like you. Nobody knows who you are. You could be anonymous. So you're not going to suffer any real life consequences, um, either physical or social, if you want to be a jerk. But it's so rude to just go through someone's body like that because we have this t tendency to automatically react to personal space. You want to respect people's personal space. If somebody walks through you, it has it's this terrible, queasy feeling. Um, so we respect, even though there's um, no consequence in the digital world, we respect the norms of, that we've learned in face-to-face -face interactions. We also react to eye contact, similarly to the way that we do in the real world. This, and this is true um, even when the human appearing objects, the avatars we're talking to, aren't true avatars, if they're controlled by the computer, it's still a little unnerving uh, to have one stare at you. It, it breaks the rules of how people normally look around in the real world. It can be creepy. Um, and broadly, we're influenced by nonverbal behavior. So there's been um, a series of, of interesting experiments um, looking at 
uh, synchrony and mimicking in virtual environments. So you guys have probably heard it's sort of a um, general understanding of nonverbal behavior that people will often sync up their gestures when they're getting along well. Um, and there's been some work looking at getting people to mimic other people to make them feel rapport, and that can work to an extent too if people don't catch on. So, we're so, so the idea that people's gestures will um, entrain and that this will be linked to getting along well, to having a sense of rapport, um, we see that in the real world, but you can also find that in virtual environments. So we're picking up these subtle cues of gesture and posture in virtual environments, um, and it seems to operate in a similar way where it can establish liking and trust. There are some really important caveats to these generalities, however. Um, one area of research is the extent to which this works uh, when you're talking to someone that you believe to be a real person as opposed to something that you know to be a com controlled by a computer. So even though it's very hard for us to overcome that tendency to treat things that look and act like people as people, if we know that it's not controlled by a real person, we react less socially to it. And similarly, if you have kind of a crummy looking avatar that you know is controlled by a real person, you still have somewhat of a social reaction to that. And we can take that back to other forms of mediated communication. If you see, if it's, a, if it's a, just a cube floating around in space, but it's your friend's voice coming from it, then you will have more social reactions coming to, to that than if it's, it's a cube controlled by the computer. So, and one more thing that comes up a lot when we talk about using virtual reality either as a tool to say that we can um, elicit social reactions with it, or if we say generally that it's a, a place where you can have social interactions that, that are real in some sense, is this idea that yes, we're reacting to this kind of experience now as if it were real because we're naive. But if everybody was using virtual reality all the time, then we'd be sophisticated um, and, we wouldn't, and we would not take it as seriously as we do now. So you, you all have heard the example of uh, when film first became uh, available, when people were taking films and showing it to big audiences, the idea that people would see a film of a train coming toward them and they would dive out of the way um, because they didn't yet have the scaffolding to say, oh, it's, it's an imaginary train, it's not gonna come through the screen and kill me. So that is uh, one argument to say that we have these intense reactions to virtual content now we, we can't make ourselves step into a virtual a, a pit. We can't make ourselves easily walk through another person's avatar because we're naive. And if we were sophisticated, then we would be able to overcome those reactions. That's kind, so that could be true to an extent, right? So certainly, um, when you first experience a new uh, medium, a new way of seeing the world, it affects you in a different way. It's exciting um, and you're, it's confusing too, so you're a little bit, have less of an ability to be suspicious about the content. We do see little different reactions. Uh, if people are very experienced video game players and sometimes they can talk themselves through um, scary virtual content. Uh, but it's also true that uh, this sense of being embodied in a virtual space goes to the, the core of how we interpret ourselves and our environment, that updating that of, of your environment, making you feel as though you were in a physical space um, is something that is very deeply in our way of understanding the world. So I would say that although people may become sophisticated in virtual environments and that may increase people's ability uh, to be more conscious about how they, they react to that content, uh, in general, uh, virtual reality in particular strongly draws on our, our world building sense uh, that we get from the sensory information of the system. So I would say that we'll probably continue to see people uh, be influenced by the content they see in VR. And also, we'll probably see really interesting ways in which people will adapt to this kind of interaction. So we've adapted to, to talking on the phone. We've adapted to communicating by te text. We'll also adapt to communicating in virtual reality. And one of the interesting questions is, how will we adapt to that and what new ways of behaving will arise? So, when we talk about how we do behave, we should also talk about how we could behave. Um, so I'm going to briefly discuss uh, a really interesting work from 2004 
that came out before a lot of, uh, before there was consumer uh, virtual reality and social interactions and consumer virtual reality as we know them today, uh, and talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages of these systems. So when we're in immersive virtual reality, um, we put information from our bodies into the system, and the system renders information about our bodies to other users and back to us. But that's, there's a wall between what we do and what we see ourselves do. So when we look at um, these avatars, we can see some of the stuff that um, is being put in to these avatars that isn't there in, in real life. So we see, for example, that although there's no gaze, there's no way for me to tell exactly if I'm making eye contact with you, these systems will build in gaze so that if my head is slightly pointing toward your avatar, it'll make an assumption often that I'm looking at you because that's a, that's a social cue that we like. Um, also, what you'll often see is that avatars will move their mouths when the person is talking. So that's something that the system is putting in. They're not tracking the movements of your lips in any way, but the system is putting in lip movements and some kinds of facial expressions to make you feel comfortable in that virtual environment um, and, and, and provide extra information. Similarly, you can see, so I picked this picture because the guy has a bent elbow all the way on the left. Um, so nobody knows where your el elbow is in virtual reality, but you can make a guess based on head and hand trackers, so other body movements will be imported into the virtual world so that you don't have a totally stiff-armed appearance like we see uh, on, for the avatars in the middle. So there's much more in the system uh, being rendered to us than is actually being tracked. Um, and But that is all that is rendered is a choice. So when we talk about what choices we can make, we can go back and think about the things that we like to see in real life and which ones we would selectively include in a virtual space. So transform social interaction basically gets at this idea that we can change what uh, we see each other doing. And some of the classic examples here look at manipulating social cues that maybe that we try to control, but that maybe aren't totally under our control. So one example is in eye contact. So when you're talking in front of a crowd, a lot of you have had this experience, you know that you're supposed to look at people to make eye contact with them so that you know that, that, you're, that everyone knows that you're paying attention to them, but it's kind of hard to do. And one way to make people, I can't walk to the front of the stage because then I'll get feedback again, but one way to make people feel as though they're paying, being paid particular attention to is for you to get close to them and look right at them. So if I could walk right up to you, sir, and talk right to you, you would feel like I was really being attentive to at least one person in the audience. Um, and likewise, if I were able to get down from the stage and walk around to the back and, and, and get close to people and specifically look at them and interact with them, you would feel kind of loved. Um, I can't do that partly because I'm uh, trapped on the stage, but I could never do that to all of you because there's only one of me. So one example of transformed social interaction is I could stand up here and talk, but on each, if we were in, interacting in virtual reality, on each of your headsets, you would see me walk up to you and make eye contact with you and make you feel like you were the most interesting person in the audience to me. Um, so there are tons of things like this you could do in virtual reality. You could have me mimic your gestures, so mimic your head movement, so you felt like I was very in tune with you. Um, we could have uh, me stand up on the stage, my avatar remains up on the stage, and I walk around to the back to see how my gestures are coming off from the back row of the audience. So we have this ability to intervene between what you do and how your actions are presented. So this is a fascinating opportunity um, for all kinds of interventions, and some of them are good, right? It might be good in a classroom to have the teacher be able to pay attention to every person, every student in the audience. That could be a net good. Uh, but if, in a business negotiation, if you knew that someone was mimicking all your gestures to try and make 
uh, you like them, that would be creepy, right? So in this paper, which I recommend you, you uh, go and read if you have a minute, they talk about the idea that there's all these opportunities to improve the world through transforming our nonverbal behavior, but that it could also reduce trust in the world. So if everybody is sort of gaming the, the system to present their best selves, uh, then it could reduce trust overall. So what's an interesting question for us now um, is when we're interacting in a virtual space, what new behaviors um, could we create to allow people to both have faith in the interactions that they're having with other people or to maybe have new kinds of experiences uh, that you can't have in real life that, you could, that could be valuable to share in, in virtual reality. So some examples of these are the ability to get perspectives from other people. So I talked about standing uh, on the stage and looking and walking around to the back and seeing my gestures, assuming that wouldn't make me extremely self-conscious. But we could also think about it as me coming into the audience and looking at the world from your perspective. So changing the, the perspective and looking at a scene uh, from someone else's point, literally from someone else's point of view. Or looking at changing behavior so that people aren't tied uh, to the expectations of, of the real world um, by having their real world appearance, right? So we think of ourselves as interacting as, as, as humans that, that, that appear as we normally do and we value that, that's precious, uh, but that's not actually required, right? We, can, we don't have to rely on the same social cues as we do in the real world. So one of the things that I value the most about uh, getting to come to talk to an uh, audience of alums is the ability to sort of hear your thoughts on what I've discussed today and also your vision of where we could go with social interactions in virtual reality and virtual reality more broadly. So I might be a little ahead of time, but I would actually love to go to answering questions from the audience and also getting comments from the audience because I know that many of you are interested in this area anyway and I'd like to hear your thoughts. Oh, there's somebody in back of you and then... I Hi, okay. <laughs> Speaking of eye contact. <laughs> so I once, uh, in my office, there was an exhibit type thing for a charity, and they had a virtual reality, and they took you to Ghana, where they provide water, and you could see everything. I'm wondering what you think of virtual reality becoming something about sharing experiences? Yes, so there's, there's a lot of interest in the idea that you can share experiences, and that some, that could be a way of increasing understanding and or empathy. So I, one of the interesting things about, is that I, I can't hear super well, but that's what you're getting at, that experience sharing. So that can either be a created experience, so where I make an environment um, where I show people what it's like to be homeless, or it could be a video environment where I just go to another place and create a video with other people, and you can be someplace you can't actually get to um, and see things uh, from that perspective. I think that's really, it's a really interesting area of research. Um, I think the only thing that I worry about is that um, there are a lot of factors that, that lead people to have understanding and empathy. So I, I don't want people to think that you can quickly gain understanding of someone else's point of view by a very brief video. On the other hand, it's an opportunity to get in information and more than information, sort of an emotional sense of being in a place that you can't get any other way. So there are a lot of people working in that area right now, and it's a rich area of development. It's also interesting because a lot of the news content seems to be going in the direction of, of, of emotional involvement through this media. Because one thing about these immersive uh, experiences is that you, it's, um, they're very emotionally evocative. So they pull you in. Um, whether or not you, you, you want it almost. So, I, I'm not sure how to go here, so oh, oh, I'll follow the mic. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I noticed that almost every footnote was between 2000 and 2010, 
And I realized that that could be because that reflects when the paper was done, but I also wonder what's been going on in the last eight years. There's been tons going on. So one of the cool things about research on virtual reality now is that I would say, so, so the dates are significant. So bef previously there have only been really a handful of labs that have been able to do research in immersive virtual reality, especially um, research on social interactions. So the papers that I put up are sort, sort of the old classics. I think, think I put up five or six. So they're older papers. Um, so one thing that's exciting right now is that there are many more labs that have the capacity to do this work. So people are, are getting into uh, virtual reality research that weren't doing it before. There's new labs like my own coming up. So uh, there is, has been an explosion of both um, applied and pure research on virtual reality. So I just gave you the greats, but I would say there's, and there's more than there ever has been before, and that is really exciting because um, even though what was previously done was great, it was just limited by the fact that there were fewer people in the field. So now there's an explosion of research. Uh, two things. Mm -hmm. um, one, I've been able to see two travel marketing applications, one of which was a walkthrough of a cruise ship that mm -hmm. was not yet delivered to market. Mm -hmm. So really based on the plans and uh, I'll say it was pretty compelling um, with a strictly 100% sort of virtual environment based on designs. The other was uh, uh, hotel rooms um, in a resort and where they used real video footage, but you were able to walk through the, could kind of port around the environment. Yeah. And um, so I think it's got a, a lot of great uh, marketing capabilities um, in an area like like travel. And so I, I think there'll probably be more in, in that vein I would expect to see. But I'm curious from, from your point of view, how is consumer adaptation of VR progressing and do you have any sense of what you think are the things that will really drive higher uptake of hmm. um, things, whether it's an Oculus Rift or a, a Samsung headset? It's an interesting question and I want to go back and mention something else from those papers I described where people would always say someday there's going to be um, consumer, there's going to be consumer virtual reality headset in every home. Um, so um, in all those papers, it was always, the answer was always in the next seven years. We'll see wide adaption. <laughs> so, so there's been several cases where people have said, oh, now is the time for VR. Um, and then it's sort of trailed off again. So one thing I hesitate to do is to, to say it's like, this is definitely, you all have a headset in your homes within the next five years. That would be fun, I think. Um, but for uh, my purposes, I'm sort of uh, not in the business of, of, uh, of, it's really not even my job to hope for it, right? Um, I'll let the market do what it, what it does and I'll continue to do research in this area because even if there isn't widespread consumer adoption, you mentioned one application that has, that's extremely useful for industry, being able to look through spaces, that sense of being physically present. Um, which has been around um, for a while now and will continue to be around even if no one has headsets in their, in their, in their home. Other areas that will continue to grow are the clinical use of virtual reality. There's a lot of unique niche cases that have been important for over a decade and will continue to be important. What I would be interested in seeing if consumer virtual reality um, does grow and become popular, I would guess that it would become, it would go through the avenue of social interactions because that's what we're so tuned to and so much of our life, um, now our mediated life is also very social. So it's a, a little bit outside uh, my area of study because I don't have to predict um, what will drive the market, just how people will react to what is available to them. But I'm particularly interested in seeing what happens in the social VR space because those custom applications like training or visualizing things that are hard to get to or expensive to build or doing clinical interventions or even educational interventions, those will still be worth doing 
even if there isn't a headset in, in, in every home. But if there is a headset in every home, I bet it's because people are using it to interact with each other. Does this activate different areas of the brain? Does it have neuropsychiatric applications for something like autism? So that's a, a really fun question to answer. So people have been interested in using social virtual reality um, as both a diagnostic for conditions like ADHD and also as a potential tool for just for everybody to practice social interaction. So there are currently startups looking at getting people to practice public speaking in virtual reality um, in, or to practice uh, social interactions for people that have more trouble with it, like in the case of autism. So that is an area of interest for two reasons, because you can, you can create interventions or situations in a very controlled manner and have repeated exposure to it. And you also have the ability to track what people are doing in the space. So you could track not just here you are practicing making eye contact, practicing having an interaction. You can also track your behavior as it's occurring in this environment. So the idea of using it as a, as a either a diagnostic tool or a sort of an aid uh, for people learning to uh, to learn new behaviors or behaviors that might be difficult for them. It's a, it's a, a rich area of research. I'm interested in your thoughts on the use of virtual reality in, in workplaces. Uh, in my agency, I, I work in Washington, D.C., and um, we're allowing more telework, uh, more mm -hmm. distance uh, work. And uh, it's a challenge for me to get my staff to turn the camera on for a WebEx, much less you know, ah. the idea that some people just don't like to be on a camera. And I'm thinking, well, you're not, as an avatar, you're not really on camera. It's, it's something else. And I'm just wondering if you've got thoughts about this for virtual work. Oh, that's it. So I was actually just talking about this um, with a colleague who's also interested in social virtual reality. And we were talking about what people want in terms of a mediated interaction. So you mentioned you can't get people to turn on the camera. And I've been that person. If it's like a meeting, it's like a, a meeting at home and it's like, I don't actually want to have a conference call with you guys in my messy living room. I would like, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna turn the camera off. So um, that's a balance, right? It's the same reason sometimes you might want to choose a text, to send a text rather than get on, on the phone. There's advantages to having a lower bandwidth interaction. Um, but there are certainly particular applications where um, you could, people would be, want to jump into the, to the world. Um, so one example is if you want to observe what somebody else is doing, it's sort of a fair trade that you'll get in and, and, and have your uh, self out there to see. Um, and it also gets at this idea that you can selectively self-present in an embodied way, in a way that you can't do on the video camera. If you turn the camera on, Whatever you decided to put on that morning is what the world's going to see. You have to, you know, whatever your hair's like, that's how it is. But in an avatar context, you do have the ability to sort of have your suit avatar, if that's what you wanted, and then uh, you could focus more on the, the quality of the conversation and sort of developing rapport naturally without being blocked by all those, uh, those visual cues that come along with your real life body. So it's an interesting point. It's like, would people turn on the, uh, the avatar more than they would turn on the camera. That's, that's something that would be fun to test in a real world environment. Let's see. I, am, I, am I following the mic? Mike. I recall sitting in a Cornell audience in about 1993 and hearing somebody describe the internet. And look what's happened. And then I think about the, uh, everything from Star Trek uh, back to Woody Allen uh, with regards to this virtual reality. And I'm wondering, as I walk around and I see everybody's nose buried in a cell phone, uh, will, is there a future for this where everybody walks around with goggles and lives in reality, in, uh, virtual reality, and, and retreats from social interaction? Have you ever thought about that kind of dark alley that this thing might lead to? Yeah, so there's, a, there's concern about that because we are at a hot moment of concern for how much, for mediated interactions in general. So my ideal world is not one in which people are in a headset um, for 24 hours a day or even eight hours a day. That would be hard. So I love VR, it's really fun to me, but I don't spend eight hours a day in the, in, in the headset um, because again, it's like we can have experiences that are different from the real world, but they're never equivalent to the real world. So if we spend our life immersed, then we are losing 
real world information. So the question is, would it be so addictive that people would be sucked into virtual environments? Um, right now, to be frank, it's like it's not comfortable to be in a headset that long, so I'm not yet concerned about it. But I do think it's it, an important area of research right now that we're all kind of scrambling to get a handle on is like, what are the long-term effects of long-term exposure to, to virtual reality among the general population? Because previously, the people that were spending a lot of time in headsets were generally people that were researching virtual reality, so they were perfectly happy to do so. So I think that that area, especially when we think about kids, like how much time kids can spend in, in virtual spaces, is one we're all trying to get ahead of right now to see um, how long pe will people feel get addicted to these kind of experiences. Um, I think it's way too uh, early to be concerned about that, but the idea that people have to manage their relationship with media, we already know that that's true. I, see, I keep seeing a hand go up in the back, but you don't have the mic. <laughs> oh, he's got the mic. Okay, maybe the mic can travel back after. Yes, Mike. So, Mike, come on. So this is sort of a long question in time, but it's a quick question now. Oh. Um, 16 years ago, I made a bet with my son um, when he was playing some video games that we would have teleporting in 20 years. We're almost there. And so I'm wondering now whether I misrepresented teleporting, that now I'm wondering if there's feedback when I'm interacting with you socially in virtual reality. Is he getting feedback that I'm interacting with him? And might that teleporting now be that my virtual space, we are both in a virtual space and he envisions me there in California and I'm here in oh, that, So this is one of my favorite areas of research is how we people can perceive. We can, we can hug and he can feel it. Um, he can laugh and, they can, and I can experience the the vibrations or whatever. So are you together, right? Is this That's the question? The question. Yeah, so, so this is a, a, an area of research that I love, right? Because uh, you certainly feel as though you're gone from your real environment. In some ways, the most interesting things get, about getting people that haven't been in virtual reality into the lab is how they feel when they come back out of it, right? So you have this, you see these cool things and then you come out and it's like, oh, I'm back in the lab. I'm back, I, I, I've left this space. So I, so, it's actually a long answer to your question, but basically I do think that, um, that one of the things about social interactions in virtual reality is this very strong sense of being with someone. And I think an, an area that I'm particularly interested in looking at right now is where are you? Are you in California? Or is he with you in, in Pennsylvania? Or are you together in some sort of neutral, are you, if you're in Facebook spaces, are you in Facebook? You know, where, where, where are you when you're together? but I would say that you are definitely together. He's got the mic. Yeah, do, do you see applications where companies might be able to use virtual reality to uh, present their performance in a more summarized way? And also from a, an investor's perspective, uh, for example, where you might be able to uh, choose the form in which you wanna see how your portfolio is performing, for example. You see any applications going on in that arena? So, Pete, so what? In, this is sort of two questions I'm going to answer. The one is, is sort of performance in VR as, as, I, as, as, a, as a performance place, um, which is, I think, like a wildly open area. And then also the question of choosing your appearance in, in VR. So, um, the first one I think I can answer broadly, which is that I think we just scratched the surface of the arts in immersive virtual reality. So I think we're going to see, this is, this is why it's so exciting to see headsets get cheap and out in the world, because it means that lots of people can get in this space and make things that I certainly haven't thought of, right? So um, I think that, w that what we could see with uh, performance and, and creativity in general in both virtual reality and augmented reality is going to be one of the most interesting developments and really the reason why I, I hope, it's not my job to hope, but I do hope that access to virtual and augmented and mixed reality gets very widespread because then it will be much, much more interesting to have more people building content and creating content. Um, in terms of customizing avatar appearance, uh, that is something that is a really interesting 
um, area of research. Um, we know from video games that people kind of like playing around uh, with, a, with appearance, with form, and there's no particular reason to adhere to how we actually look like in the real world in virtual reality. Like we don't have to. We can, we can, if we want to be a cube, we can be a cube. Um, but uh, when we see virtual reality combine with our real social selves in the real world, it's also a, a question, for example, if you're on Facebook, uh, you might want to look like yourself, and then we, you need to have the tools to look like yourself, and those tools need to be built for uh, the audience. So, face, so I'm, I'm picking on Facebook spaces uh, because they have the ability to customize avatars, but there's still things you can't do in the avatars. As far as I know, you can't have an asymmetrical face yet. Everybody's pretty symmetrical. You can't look yet old. So if I go in there, it's like I'm very smooth, but you don't have the ability um, to, to be very wrinkly. It's like they're working on having different hairstyles and having different skin colors, but you still can't have, if you have like a face tattoo, you, you, as far as I know, they might have updated it. You can't get that in. So the idea of customizing avatars is interesting because in theory, you could do anything you wanted. And if you have somebody coming up from, the, from sort of the ground up, they can create any avatar that they have the skills to create. But when we think about it as a social platform too, if we're interacting on somebody else's platform, how will they let us be? How will we be allowed to present ourselves? And how will we want to present ourselves? So does that kind of get at the two questions? So one of those more arts in which I say, I wait for, for the community to show me. Um, and then in terms of avatar customization, um, it can and should be very broad how people may represent themselves. Uh, myriad information that businesses want to put out. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe this is a tool that can be used to kind of summarize it in a way that is more accessible to the person looking at. Uh-huh all that information about how a business is performing. Okay, so I, yeah. think, so I apologize. I think I misunderstood your original question. Do you mean more data visualization? Like Something along those lines, yes. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple ways in which that there are, well, there are, as I, again, there are probably more opportunities than, than, certainly than I can think of myself. But yeah, it gives you the ability to have it add another dimension to your analysis, right? So literally a third dimension, you can walk around. Um, and it also gives the ability to interact with the data and with other people looking at the data in novel ways, right? So you can, you can in theory, you could um, look at content together and get the advantage, which seems, um, yeah, it's not, it's not trivial. So anybody that's had the experience of looking at even a, 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 a three-dimensional object on a screen with other people in a conference call and tried to point to something, it's, it's, it's brutal. It's a brutal experience. You're trying to, you have a, a model of some object that you're trying to, to have rapid prototype and you're trying to point to some part of it and it's just, it's just awful to do in two dimensions. So in a virtual space, that's very easy. I think what you're talking about is, is broadly looking at sort of, it, it, data analytics in a, in a new platform. And I think that that is something that, uh, again, we will see really creative examples of as more people get into the field and start coming up with cool ways of looking at their content. So, so short answer is yes, it could be very cool. I have a question about, uh, and sort of apropos to some of your comments before about being addicted and what have you. And, I've heard of situations, and I can conceive of myself, of putting on the goggles and becoming very disori disoriented. And if there have been studies about the effect of that in disorientation, and then the opposite of after being involved for a number of hours, reorienting to the real world, and if there have been issues with, with regard to that. So after, so after some hours gets it a special case, right? Because um, people haven't, have, there are not very many people who spent hours and hours and hours in VR. Pro gamers would be probably the best um, option. But uh, when it talks about people having, struggling with the environment, do you mean people feeling like sort of cyber sickness, pe people feeling uncomfortable? Yeah, so that's a, a huge challenge for adoption, right? If you make people sick, then uh, they're not going to stick around very long. So I've seen when 
from my earliest work when I was in graduate school working with uh, virtual reality systems to today when we have these more plug and play systems, um, the issue of cyber sickness has improved a lot, but, it is a, but it's, it's both a hardware and software problem and it's one that I think it, people are continually frantically trying to improve because um, even if, it's, if one person gets sick, it can really kill the experience for them. So, and there are still people who will get sick, right? There's still people who are not comfortable in virtual reality. So that is an ongoing area of research and improvement. And then the question of how people orient back to the real world, oh, that's also interesting. So um, some of my earlier work and work that I, I still work on looks at changing people's movements in virtual reality. And um, for example, um, giving people an extra hand to interact with the world with and seeing if they could adapt to those kind of avatars, if they could do tasks with those kind of avatars. But sort of a secondary question is, what would happen when they came out of the virtual world after being in those avatars for a few minutes? So I've told the story before, um, and hopefully it won't get me in trouble because um, one of the early experiments, we switched people's arms and legs to see if they could adapt to moving around a virtual environment with arms and legs switched. Um, so the short answer is yes, people were very adaptive. It's, we're, we're tool makers and we adjust. But one of the secondary questions is what happens if you do that? So the lab that I was working in was on the fourth floor and it's like, are people gonna go out of the lab and just fall down the stairs? So if when we started running the experiment, we would track people as they left. It's like, okay, are you okay? Do you feel okay? Can you leave the lab? So the answer is, is that physically people, at least in the short term, people adapt, uh, have no problem transitioning back to the real world in a physical sense. So as always caveats, that was short term, right? So if you spent, heaven forbid, 48 hours in virtual reality, you would have other problems. Uh, but I cannot say what your motor coordination would be like when you got out of that, besides all the other reasons why you would feel terrible. Um, and then there's also some interesting questions about how people um, would make the transition between the, the real world um, and the virtual world sort of emotionally, where it's like, oh, I was, I was in another place, engaged in these, these interactions somewhere else for a long time. Is that, do we need to worry about people transitioning back and forth between those environments. So it's one reason to say again, it's like let, let's look at what happens in our little short-term experimental context and see if we can extrapolate what may happen in long-term context before we get to the point where we have uh, every elementary school kid spending 18 hours a day in a virtual environment. I, 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 wanna, I, I feel like I'm in a classroom, so I want to, to call on people, but the mic, where is it? Hi. Uh, I know you, this has been a great discussion on, you know, social VR, but I guess one of, one of the things you touched on briefly was about AR and augmented reality, right? And so I'm curious, I guess two parts. One, have you, has part of your work been including, you know, augmented reality? Uh, yeah, so okay. I, well, I'm curious what the second part is. So Sure. So I guess my, the, the, the reason for asking that is just to understand, wh wouldn't you argue that augmented reality has greater potential social implications than, you know, virtual reality? Because to me, I mean, just think about meeting somebody in a social context and you go, ha having a heads up display and being able to see like, how do I know this person? What's her name again? Oh yeah, that's Andrea. And I know her from Cornell and, oh, here's a conversation cue about something you could talk about with her. Because to me, those sort of things like have so much greater social implication than anything that VR does. So broadly about uh, augmented reality, uh, one of the things I, I said to my class at the end of this year is like, okay, so I've, I've touched on augmented or mixed reality a little bit in this class and that is an area of interest, like particularly social interactions in augmented reality is an area that I'm interested in, especially for clinical applications. So I do think it's a really promising area. Um, and I think that we're going to see a lot this year about new exciting ways to interact socially in, in AR or mixed reality. I do want to say, do you remember Google Glass? Okay, do you remember how much people loved the idea of having somebody look at them with, with goggles and reading their, their bio online? People did not love it at all. <laughs> so I would say that, um, that even though for, that it's a really interesting use case, right? So at that time I was on the West Coast in, in San Francisco and there was an enormous amount of pushback from people being like, no, it's this great, amazing tool and it was really fun. And then people being very resentful of the idea that you would have that kind of access to that kind of information. So I think that um, it's, not an, it's not necessarily 
um, a very, an easy sell. It's not as easy a sell as maybe everyone thought it would be. Um, but I do think that um, there are even more exciting um, applications for, for augmented reality that um, get at things that, that you can do um, in AR that you can't do in VR. So we heard, for example, in virtual reality where you might not want to see, to see or present your full self. You might want to log in as an avatar for different reasons. So I think that there will always be a place for immersive virtual reality for, for that particular kind of application. But there could also be a place for, there, there will be a place for social augmented reality beyond just having like a dossier on somebody that you could pull up. So just the idea that you could both be together in a space and not have any um, transmission, like lag between your conversation, but you could look at a digital object that wasn't there, right? Or you could share content in an augmented space that nobody else could see. Or you could have somebody else come in and be with you, be present in your environment with you um, in, in um, a way where you would see them present in your environment. So I think there is a huge role for um, augmented mixed reality in social interactions too. But I think we need to think even bigger than having it be sort of the information we could get from our phone and think more broadly about what those interactions could look like. So um, I, I apologize. I came in after you got started. Is your background I can't, in, I can't see in where neurology? You are. Oh, gotcha. OK, I see you. Is your background in neurology? My background is in is not in neurology. Uh, it's in my degree is in communication. I studied at the um, Stanford Virtual Human Interaction Lab. Um, although there is some interesting work looking at um, sort of the the visualizing what happens in the brain when people have certain experience, experiences in virtual reality, it's complicated because one of the characteristics of being in VR is that you move, and one of the things you don't want to do in an fMRI machine is move. So the ability to get that data it can be done, uh, but it's a little more complicated. So the existing research on virtual reality is small and getting bigger, and the existing research so, so in virtual reality from a neurological standpoint is smaller, but also getting bigger. All right, so there is that type of research going on because the, the question. Yeah, there's a bit, and there's, it's one of those things that um, it is something that should be included when we think about how to assess the consequences of using, being present, and seeing our, our movements represented in a virtual space. I asked the question in the context of the herd mentality in terms of the potential for virtual reality to impact the brain. Mm -hmm. So it is to make people more susceptible to um, thought control. I mean, I'm not sure how else yeah, to Yeah, I think we got, so I think some earlier questions looking at concerns about, well, it's like, what happens? What happens if you're in the space for a long time? And even what I talked about, about uh, when people see their gestures represented in a non, in a not totally realistic way, how that could, we know we're very influenced by the visual, generally, it's visual feedback on our movements can influence in the very short term. So that is one context in which to ask that question for sure. Ma'am, you have the mic at last. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wanted to, um, you alluded to this slightly commercial and um, entertainment, um, mm -hmm. the entertainment industry. Uh, a couple of years ago, I helped a young graduate student, film student, um, and he had shot a narrative film in virtual reality. Uh, I watched it, I found it extremely annoying. You found it <laughs> annoying? I found it extremely annoying. <laughs> Because uh, you don't know where to look. You're, it's a, it was a narrative, you know, a feature film. And so you, you know, it's, you focus on the characters, the main characters, or by the way, you could look over here and see what's behind that door and that sort of thing. Right. Anyway, and, but the thing is that the entertainment industry, the film industry, has not embraced this for feature films. And we've seen what's happened with 3D. So what do you predict for this sort of film, uh, this, this techn uh, technology used in feature films? It's really a new medium, right? So you alluded, and with narrative in particular, this is an issue. It's like we have all sorts of traditions um, in classic filmmaking. It's like how do we direct people's attention? It's like how do you cue people where to look in a scene? What's going to be important later? Um, and those were developed over decades. And when, when we see films now, we're also building on our 
unconscious understanding of the conventions of filmmaking, but just the idea of, of where to, to get people to direct their attention is enormously challenging in immersive film because you can look anywhere and if you see some leaf blowing over in the corner of, of, of your eye, you could be looking at that and you could miss the whole murder, right? It, it, there's, it, you're, the direction is there. You have another? Yeah, because it's it, in a way it's in the in the middle, but it's pointing nowhere, right? So I think that that and this goes back to to my um, wrong answer to um, the gentleman sitting in the back, where I answered a question about art that he wasn't asking. But it is it, it is a question about art. It's 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 those conventions. Um, we can think of some ways in which uh, we can direct people's attention. We look at other people, right? We look at at, at movement. Uh, we look at color. But those conventions of how to make uh, artistic experience are still being developed and I think it's it, again the more people who have access to this kind of content building the more successes we might see and I am, am not going to be able to predict all of the advances that will be made in that area but it's very much in its infancy it's not a stepping off point from classic filmmaking I got a question for you can you hear me on this or not pretty well yeah. all right uh, one of the trends we've seen in internets and uh, cell phones is cyberbullying and uh, trolling and things like that. Do you think VR is going to make this more likely or less likely? So some of you guys might have seen an article that came out oh, like a year and a half ago about people being harassed in virtual spaces because you can go online and play games with other people in immersive virtual reality. Did anybody see that? It was a, I think it was on Medium. It was, it was depressing. It was... Um, a woman was in um, playing an archery game in VR, I believe. Forgive me for if I summarize this incorrectly, but essentially she was playing in a space that she didn't have a body, right? So she was just represented uh, by you know hands and this bow. But uh, we're really good at telling gender cues from voice for the most part, so other people in the game knew that she was a woman. Um, and some jerk decided to um, harass her by going in and sort and like groping around the bow like he was grabbing her. Uh, and she was really fr frustrated and annoyed and tried to get away from him and ended up quitting the game. And it was, she wrote uh, up the experience as saying it's like, I had this crazy experience even though I didn't have a body. Again, we talk about how um, there's no physical consequence to interactions in virtual reality. It felt terrible and I can tell you, as I said, it's like if you walk through somebody in virtual reality, it feels terrible. He was trying to make her feel bad and he succeeded in making her feel bad. So there's interest in thinking about how can we protect a bit against harassment in a virtual space, or if you can. So one example was, and this was implemented in, um, you can turn it off and on, but um, I think it was high fidelity, but um, other environments have created this bubble where you can't actually get near somebody to poke at them. Um, if, you get, if you get closer to whatever space they sell, they, um, whatever space they set, you get bounced back which is sort of a quick fix, but is kind of an interesting one. So I think, um, I don't know if, I think more or less depends on the culture of the spaces that people are in, right? So if you have um, a space where everybody's adhering to family-friendly norms, then people will do what they would do in that context. And if you have a wilder space, people will adhere to the norms there. But there are, um, it's interesting to think about what, uh, tools might be available to, um, to define the kind of interactions that you can have in that space. Um, one thing um, that's interesting to think about, this is just an example, um, is uh, how, how close you can get to somebody, um, what the avatars look like, right? So avatars in Facebook spaces don't have legs. So you have a whole different suite of avail available interactions that you can and can't have in, in, in virtual reality. So, uh -oh. So I guess the answer to that question is basically, I, I don't know if, if we would see more or less bullying. I think that depends on the, on the uh, culture, but um, there are different tools available for that. Thank you very much.